you to turn in your Bibles now to the book of Jonah. Jonah is one of the most misunderstood and disbelieved books of the Bible. Many Christians, even many that believe in the Old Testament as being inspired and relevant, believe that Jonah is a fable or an allegory, just a story that somebody made up. It's also misunderstood. Many consider it to be simply the entertaining story of a man and a whale. But actually, Jonah's a story of a man resisting God. Jesus made several references to Jonah during his ministry. Matthew 12 and Luke 11. Jesus compared the time he was to spend in the tomb to the time Jonah was in the belly of the fish. Jesus compared his mission to that of Jonah, a message to turn hearts back to God. There are other similarities between Jonah and Jesus. Jonah was born in the town of gath Hefer, just an hour's walk from Nazareth, where Jesus lived as a child and grew up. Jonah was the first prophet of Galilee. Jesus was also a prophet of Galilee. Some Bible scholars think that Jonah is the finest short story ever written. It is full of important lessons that reveal to us the character of God. Today's message will be the first of two parts. The theme for today's message is to obey God is to succeed in life. To obey God is to succeed in life. Jonah 1, verses 1 through 3. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with him unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. God has a plan for your life. Just as surely as God had a place called Nineveh for Jonah to be, God has a specific place for you to serve him. And I pray that during this service, you will open your heart and let God speak to you, telling you the need that he wants you to fill. God has a place for each of us to serve. Unfortunately, sometimes it's a difficult place. Nineveh was quite the difficult place. Nineveh was a very old city founded by Nimrod just after the Tower of Babel experience that Genesis 10, 11 talks about. Nineveh was well over a thousand years old in Jonah's day. It was located about 230 miles north of Baghdad on the east bank of the Tigris River, right across from the present day city of Mosul. We've all heard of that when we talk about the Middle East. It was a proud city. Zephaniah 2.15 says, This is the exultant city which dwells securely, who says in her heart, I am and there is no one besides me. But that's not what Nineveh was really known for. Nineveh was notorious for its cruelty and its wickedness. The book of Nahum consists of only three chapters, and all three chapters are devoted to stating 
of the evil that existed in Nineveh and God's judgments against it. Nahum 3, verses 1 through 3, talk about Nineveh being full of blood and lies and robbery and there being a multitude of slain there. Nineveh was a brutal town. It was capital of the brutal Assyrians. It was perhaps the greatest example in history of ruling by intimidation and fear. In Nineveh, when they didn't like something somebody said, they would literally pull his lips off. And Jonah was supposed to walk up and down the streets of Nineveh talking about their wickedness? Would you have gone to Nineveh? Or they tore off your hands, cut off noses and ears, put out eyes. In the city square, great heaps of skulls were piled, skulls of their former enemies. You could easily lose your head in Nineveh. Can you understand why perhaps Jonah would be reluctant to go? But let's be fair to Jonah. Despite their reputation, there is no evidence to suggest that Jonah was afraid to go and talk to the Ninevites. To him, it seemed as though nothing could be gained by preaching in Nineveh. And besides, he hated their wickedness. He wanted to see them punished. And isn't that the way we are? What happened after 9-11? We wanted to find out who was responsible, and we wanted to see them punished and brought to justice. Whatever the reasons, God had a message to be preached in Nineveh, and Jonah did not want to go. God has a place for you to serve, and you may have turned God down just like Jonah did, because maybe you find it a difficult place to go. But remember, to obey God is to succeed in life. Now, God will not force you to follow his plan. Notice the third verse again, Jonah 1, verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. And so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with him unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, from where Jonah was, Nineveh was probably about that direction over there, about 500 miles away. Jonah went over to the coast, this text says, and went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, which is about that direction over there, about 2,000 miles that direction. He was getting about as directly opposite to God's plan for his life as he possibly could without discovering America. Tarshish was, was across the Mediterranean, past Greece, past Italy, all the way to the southern coast of Spain. In Jonah's day, the trip usually took a full year to complete. Jonah was determined to get as far away from Nineveh for as long a time as possible as he could. Did you ever go to Tarshish? Ever been in Tarshish? God is going to whisper to somebody here that you ought to be out this afternoon visiting some discouraged Christian and you're going to go to bed instead and when you do, write the name over the headboard, Tarshish. God has given you money for his cause to finish the work and you spend it on yourself instead. That's going to Tarshish. God has a plan for your life. He's got a Nineveh for each of us. But some of us go in the opposite direction. Tarshish. Let me say to the young people that are here today, it's kind of typical of youth to say, oh, I want to be good. I want to do what's right. I want to follow Christ someday. You see, later on when I get a little older, later on when I finish my education, well, later on after I 
find that special someone and get married. Later on, after we have children, later on, after I've had a successful career, later on, after the children are all grown up, later on, a little later, young people don't put off God's plan for your life. A boy came panting down the sidewalk and arrived at the bus stop just as the bus pulled out, and he missed it. A man stood there watching, and he chuckled a little, and then he sympathized with the boy. He said, son, you didn't run fast enough. Between gulps of air, the boy replied, no, sir, I ran fast enough because I ran as fast as I possibly could. I just didn't start soon enough. Young people start soon enough. Don't wait until you've gotten so far toward Tarshish that Nineveh just seems like it's just way too far away. Don't wait to follow God's plan for your life. Now, disobedience to God's plan brings failure. Some of you are probably football fans like me. Not proud of it, but I do like to watch football. And, of course, the playoffs started last week, and they'll continue again this weekend. Football fans will appreciate the book of Jonah because notice the four downs of Jonah. Jonah 1, verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with him unto Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. Verse 5, Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. And then finally, Jonah chapter 2 and verse 6, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet thou hast brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Down, 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 down. From the time Jonah decided to try to escape from God, there was only one direction his life could take, and that was down. Jonah went down to Joppa, he went down into the boat, he went down into the hold of the ship, he went down into the depths of the sea. And if your life seems to be going down, 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 stop trying to run away from God. Now, not only do our personal lives fail when we try to run away from God, but it hurts other people as well. Jonah 1, verses 4 and 5. Jonah 1, 4 and 5. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. Now, these poor sailors hadn't done anything wrong. How come these fellows were all seasick and frightened in the midst of a horrible storm? It was because of that rascal Jonah. You see, when we start trying to run away from God, it not only hurts us, but it makes other people suffer too. When God made you, he didn't make you for yourself alone. He didn't make you for himself alone. He made you that you might be a blessing to those around you. The first chapter of the book, Desire of Ages, deals with this principle of giving, the principle that exists in all of creation. Quoting the Desire of Ages is, even now, after sin, all created beings declare the glory of God. There is nothing but the selfish heart of man that lives unto itself. No bird that cleaves the air, no animal that moves upon the ground but ministers to some other life. There is no leaf of the forest or lowly blade of grass but has its ministry. Sun, ocean, flowers all exist to give. The angels find their greatest joy in giving. 
All things Christ received from God, but he took to give. Jesus' life was all about giving. Life's not what you take, but what you give. <clears throat> Why is it that the lost and the end of time are lost? Jesus put it all in perspective. When he spoke in Matthew 25, you might want to read that later today, verses 31 through 46, talk about the final judgment when everyone that's ever lived on the earth is gathered before the great throne in heaven. The final judgment occurs, all the nations are gathered, and God puts all the sheep on the right hand and all the goats on the left. And he talks about the difference on those that are his sheep and compares those with those that are the goats. The sheep are the one who live to serve others. Jesus said, and as much as you have done it unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. Why are the lost in the end of time lost? They have not discovered the principle of giving. The lost are lost because they live to serve themselves. They live to take rather than to give. They wouldn't be happy in heaven. They're a piece of a jigsaw puzzle out of the wrong box. There's just no place for them there. What kind of person are you? What am I? A giver or a taker? For God so loved the world that he gave. How often have you thought when you've seen some awful problem in this world, why doesn't God do something? He's all powerful, he's all knowing. Did you ever stop to look at it this way? God made a person and he gave that person all of the talent necessary and he made available the education and the experience that that person might go and help answer that problem and that person refused to answer the call, refused to go, and we blame God for doing nothing? I wonder how many sick people there are in the world because God called somebody to be a doctor or a nurse and they went off to Tarshish instead. I wonder how many uninspired and bored students are sitting in classrooms this school year because God gave someone the ability to teach and they went off to Tarshish instead. I wonder how many unhappy and unsaved people are still awaiting the good news of salvation because a minister, because a Bible worker went off to Tarshish instead. I wonder how many hungry people there are in our own neighborhoods because we overfeed ourselves. I wonder how many emotionally crippled people exist that way because their mothers and their fathers lived for themselves and never learned to love. I had such a sad conversation with one of my coworkers a number of years ago. And I didn't know much about her background. Her name was Anita. And I got to talking with her one day, and it was kind of interesting because we had seven children. She was one of eight in her family when she grew up, and so we were kind of comparing our childhoods and, and raising kids and all that. And I got the sense pretty quickly that she was very bitter about her childhood. She told me a little bit about what it's like and then she told me something that I will never forget. She said there were eight of us children. And you know what, there were no favorites, she told me. We were all equally hated. I wonder how many emotionally crippled people exist that way because their mothers and their fathers lived for themselves and never learned to love. I wonder how many lonely people there are in this church because God called us to love them and we didn't. I wonder how many people are not in church at all today because we don't care. 
We go to church, we sing a song, we listen to the Sabbath school teacher and the preacher, and then we go home, and then what do we do for somebody else all day Sabbath? How about during the rest of the week? What plans do you have to give of yourself, of your time, of your money, of your concern, of your tears, of your prayers in 2020? What plans have you made? God has a place for you to serve him. And if you choose not to fill that place, you will be hurt and others will hurt also. But let's not dwell on the negative. Let's look now at the positive that we can learn from this story. Because you see, on the other hand, obedience to God's plan for your life will guarantee you success. If I can use just another sports analogy, I have my favorite team, and I start the year like all the other 32 teams' fans, thinking this could be the year, you know, that we make the playoffs, that we win a few games, maybe we get to the Super Bowl, maybe we win it all. But you know, only one 32nd of all those people rooting for their teams are going to end the season happy. That's the sad truth. And so almost every year ends in disappointment for me. It ends in a loss. And that's the way it is with all sports. I mean, you have your favorite and probably they're not going to win. The beautiful thing I love about Christianity, about following Christ, is that Christ guarantees success for every single follower of his. We're all winners with Christ. And I love that about Christianity. Let's see what happened to our friend Jonah. Jonah 2, verse 10. The Lord spake into the fish and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. When God called Jonah, he went in the opposite direction. When he commanded the fish, it did exactly as it was told. Sometimes fish obey much better than prophets. Jonah 3, verses 1 and 2, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Jonah got a second chance. Aren't you happy today for God's second chances? I don't care how many times you've tried to run away from God, to run away from his plan for your life. He is still seeking you. He is always ready to give you another chance. Jonah 3, verse 3. So Jonah arose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. Nineveh was about 20 times the size of Jerusalem. A much larger city than Jonah had probably ever seen. The stronghold of the city was about 30 miles long and 10 miles wide. It was marvelous in appearance. Five walls and three canals surrounded it. The walls were 100 feet high and each wide enough for four chariots to be driven side by side on the top of them. There were great and beautiful palaces and the finest gardens. The city temple was in the form of a great pyramid which glittered in the sun. Jonah must have been impressed, a lesser prophet, perhaps intimidated. But Jonah fearlessly obeyed this time. And let's see what happens now. Jonah 3, verses 4 through 10. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. 
But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Whoever would have expected that kind of evangelistic series in Nineveh, of all places. Perhaps the greatest mass conversion story of all time. 120,000 people, according to Jonah 4, verse 11. Prophets and Kings, page 270, says the Spirit of God pressed the message home to every heart and caused multitudes to tremble because of their sins and to repent in deep humiliation. Brothers and sisters, with every divine command, there comes the power to fulfill it. History brings a very interesting oddity. It's only a possibility, I'll warrant that, but let me share a bit of history with you. In 765 BC, a terrible plague came to Nineveh. June 15, 763, two years later, there was a total eclipse of the sun in Nineveh. These were sun worshipers. 759 B.C., another devastating plague hit Nineveh. All this within the span of about five or six years. This was about the very time that Jonah came to talk to the people. The point, God does not assign anybody a tough task unless he volunteers himself to go before you and work the miracles necessary to accomplish that task. God will never ask you to go any place where he has not gone before you. To follow God's plan for your life is to succeed. And the only way you can manage to fail is to refuse God's plan. Now that doesn't mean that all of your problems will disappear. But to realize God's leading in your life will allow you to overcome those problems. Example. Jane is a plain Jane. People go so far as to tell her so, although she has it proven to herself every time she looks in the mirror. But you see, Jane is a Christian. And she knows that when God made her, it was not a mistake. It was because he needed somebody just like her. And she says to herself, I'm going to let the love of the Lord Jesus so fill my life that I will, through his power, have a beautiful Christ-like character. And incidentally, 30, 40 years later, she'll be much prettier than her friends who are naturally endowed. John sits in class, staring at the blackboard. All the rest of the class are busily writing, and they seem to be accomplishing just what the teachers asked them to do. John's mind is a blank slate. He's trying, but he feels positively stupid, a failure. Some of his classmates wonder what line he was in when the brains were passed out. But if John is a Christian, he says to himself, well, I might not be very good at this kind of thing, but God didn't waste time when he made me. Some place there's something that he made me to be really good at. And God guarantees success for John and for Jane. He guarantees success for each one of us. Christ helps us succeed by showing us what he designed us to be good at. Someone has said that the typical teenager believes that in the great commercial of life, he or she is brand X. You know, the one that always fails, the one that everything else is better than. Young people, that's simply not so. You have the capacity to be very good at something. And if you seem to be failing at everything, it's because you have not yet found God's plan for your life. I don't know if you can identify this. Probably everyone's got something like this in their home. 
super glue. How would you like to brush your teeth with super glue? I thought about it for these nagging dentures sometimes that maybe, you know, but no, I don't think I'll stick with extra strength polygrip or whatever. How about super glue in your gas tank? Again, I don't recommend that. Or maybe when you go home today, how about trying a little on your mashed potatoes? Again, do not try this at home or anywhere. And yet, when you need a super strong, super fast bond, now I sound like a commercial, don't I? It's pretty amazing stuff, isn't it? Just one little drop. In fact, a number of years ago, we had an old washing machine that seemed like it was always in use. You try having seven kids and two adults in the same house and try to, it's your day for laundry, and if you miss it, you're in bad shape. But our washing machine timer went out, you know, the knob that you turn and set the settings on it. And it was a pretty old washer by then. I still have the same washer now, by the way. <laughs> Amazingly enough, it probably outlived me. But the knob we called around because of an older washer, it was hard to find the part for it, you know, and we couldn't find it anywhere. And finally, somebody located a part, and it was going to cost $120 for this knob. I'm like, really? Really? And so I took, <laughs> I had nothing to lose at this point, right? It was that or get a new washing machine, which is probably what we needed. But again, it's still working. Praise God. So I put a couple drops of that on there and stuck the knob on there, waited a little while. Still working 20 years later. Pretty good stuff. My commercial's over. You can get, get your own brand. <laughs> it's a tremendous product for the place that it was designed to be in. If you don't feel like you're successful in life, it's because you've not yet opened your mind to the working of the Holy Spirit and let God show you what you were designed to be and then let God lead you into success in whatever that thing might be. Whatever niche that you have the talent for that God has given you. Conclusion, God has a plan for your life whether you're five or 105. Not just a long-range plan, but a short-range plan as well. I think he has a specific something in mind for you today, this week, for the year 2020, as well as for the rest of your life. He won't force you to follow his plan, but disobedience to God's plan brings failure. Following God's plan brings success. Remember Jonah. In the desert, I walked proudly toward the cool oasis. I knew the way. And when God came by and said that he knew the way, I said, I have a map. Besides, I'm a guy. I don't need directions, right? I didn't need God, and he irritated me. Because every time I looked around, he was following me. When I was thirsty and searching for a spring among the rocks, he caught up with me. He had a canteen of cold water, and he said, if you drink this, you will never thirst again. But I, knowing this was impossible, said, thanks, but there's a spring just over the hill. I know it's coming up. But over the hill, the water was brackish. Human bones were strewn everywhere, bleaching in the desert sun. Parched, exhausted, I fell beside the pool, determined, defiant, trying to rest, but no rest came. Then God caught up again and said, if you need shade, I have a tent. Well, never mind, God, I'm resting well. Although it was obvious I was lying, he said nothing. Ashamed, I leaped to my feet, and out over the burning sand I ran, my eye on the horizon. I threw away the map. There it was, the oasis. Tired, hungry, bleeding, but triumphant. 
I looked over my shoulder. God was running after me. He was carrying a larger pack than before. Water, food, medicine, bandages, shelter. I scorned them. Leave me alone, God. He slowed down and stopped. In the distance was the oasis shining in the sun. I would show him. I stumbled on for a long time before I realized the oasis was only a mirage. Slowly, the night came on. It grew black. I was thirsty, so thirsty. I was hungry, I was tired, I was bleeding. The desert was now cold. I stopped, sat down on a rock and put my head in my hands. I was lost, I knew it now, I was hopelessly lost. But from behind my rock, I heard a noise. And when I looked around, there was God. People don't fail going God's way. People fail going away from God. Set your back on Tarshish and your face toward Nineveh and say, I will succeed there because God is there going before me and always going with me. Jonah 3, verse 1, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Thank God for second chances. God is speaking to you. He's speaking to me today. Perhaps for the second time, the third, the fourth, maybe you've lost count. How will you respond today? The amazing thing is that your past choices, your past life don't matter to God. He only wants to save you today. To erase your past sins today, to give you a clean slate, a fresh start today. He wants to have a relationship with you today and from now on. He loves you that much. How will you respond today? If you've resisted his leading, if you've even scorned him, God is still searching. He's still following. He's still loving you. Please respond to God's love today. Give your heart, give your life, give your talents to Jesus. Only then will you find true success in 2020 and for the rest of your life. Our dear loving Father, we're all your prodigal children. We all try to run away and do our own thing and we waste our talents, we waste our money, we waste our time on selfish things. And Lord, today we want to come home. And we're so thankful that you, as our Father God, as in the story of the prodigal son, are anxiously awaiting our return, constantly looking for us to appear, to restore that relationship. And we're so thankful that you're the God that comes running to meet us and ignores every filthiness about us and every sin and every shortcoming and every selfishness that we have in our lives and just covers us with the robe of your righteousness. Cover us today with the robe of your righteousness because ours will never do. And Lord, help us every day during this week, during this month, during this year, for the rest of our lives to have that relationship with with you that will not only change us but will help us to use the talents and the gifts that you have given us for good 
for others. Lord, we want to be givers and not takers because God so loved the world that he gave. May we all learn to be givers like you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.